the Grey Knights. Humanity is beset by countless evils. Against many, armies can be raised, hatred can be stoked, vigilance for that which is not human can be maintained. Not so the demon, the lie made flesh, for to even know of such creatures is to risk one's essence. The soul of the Grey Knight is sacrosanct, and their purity is incorruptible. The silvered armour of this chapter's warriors is bound with incantations, engraved with sigils of warding. Their blades shine with the inner light of their sanctity, for each of these space marines is a psychic warrior, in empiric communion with his battle brothers. Empowered by minds constantly on guard, they can cut steel with bare hands, their eyes blaze with fire, and even the power of their words flays the otherworldly skin of demons. In shadow do these knights of Titan fight. From the underbelly of teeming worlds full of mortal pawns to mutating planets slick with the taint of the Empyrean, where lesser warriors' sanity would not survive. They are the Imperium's surest defence against that which the Emperor foresaw would be its greatest threat. The Grey Knights are humanity's blade against the demon, and only they offer mankind hope of anything more than hollow victories. The 666th Chapter None now alive can claim to know the origins of the Grey Knights with certainty, the chapter themselves have a single written account of their founding, housed in their fortress monastery, the Citadel of Titan. From this, and other legendary sources known to very few, a story of dire peril, a priceless gift, and the concealment of soul-shattering knowledge can be pieced together. It was during the final days of the Horus Heresy, so it is said, that the founders of the Grey Knights were first convened, even as the Emperor, his generals and advisers, prepared terror for the onslaught of his wayward son, the arch-traitor Horus. Thrice damned! The master of mankind contemplated threats even greater. Certain myths of that distant age hint that the Emperor alone foresaw the danger posed by chaos and the Immaterium's denizens, its demons and gods. These coalescences of emotion, given terrible existence in the warp, would not be satisfied by mankind's destruction, only by its corruption, subjugation, and eternal torment. Ambiguous references suggest the Emperor's most trusted servant, Malkador the Sigilite, scoured the war-torn Imperium while the heresy raged, directed by the Emperor to seek individuals whose shoulders would bear the burden of saving humanity's future. Among those Malkador eventually presented to the Emperor, it is thought that there were eight space marines. Peerless in their dedication to the Imperium, aware of the warp's threats and potent in their esoteric abilities, each of the eight were approved, and the Emperor tasked Malkador with the next stage. Malkador took the group of space marines to Titan, a frigid moon of Saturn. Through means now unknown, the Sigilite had hidden the Emperor's works on Titan from traitors and loyalists alike. According to one electro-tapestry, Malkador revealed a fortress monastery established in desperate secrecy. Inside it were the means to found a chapter, one not descended from the legions that still fought, but forged anew from gene seed wrought by the Emperor in isolation. How long it had taken such a plan to unfold... How long it had taken to find suitable recruits, forge specialist weapons and war gear, and more besides, perhaps not even Malkador knew. It is suspected that it was he who appointed one of the eight, known to legend as Janus, to lead the nascent chapter as its first supreme grand master. What happened next has slipped even from the true understanding of the Grey Knights. With Terra herself braced to face the heretical legions of Horus, a sorcerous enchantment of unprecedented power loosened Titan from reality's grip. The moon vanished from orbit, sliding into the warp. Time and bloodshed overtook the Sol system. Titan endured, anchored somewhere in the Empyrean. 
Those upon it, unaware of the heresy's tragic conclusion, toiled to bring the Emperor's gift to humanity, to fruition, while titanic energies strove to protect the world from the warp's roiling embrace. Years passed in real space, and who knows how many within the timeless warp before Titan reappeared. When it did so, it was during the confusion and anarchy of the Second Founding. The growing Inquisition, it is whispered, had a hand in much of that endeavour's work. It is in records of the Second Founding that the Grey Knights first appear, enshrined as the 666th chapter of the Adeptus Astartes. Some say that when Malkador presented to the Emperor his exceptional individuals, besides the Space Marines, there were shadowy men and women of steely and inquiring nature. The truly incautious suggest the Inquisition itself had its origins in this same conclave. The Ordo Malleus is one of the primary organs of that feared institution. Its diverse members investigate the traces of chaos, the demonic, and anything tainted by the warp. Nowhere and no one is beneath or beyond their gimlet gaze. To root out solitary miners tainted by long-buried artefacts, mutant bordellos among heaving hive cities, weakening the warp's barriers with debaucheries, even demonic possession of those at the highest levels, an inquisitor has near limitless power and no qualms about its application. Audemalius inquisitors are iron-willed individuals, granted access to knowledge of chaos that would drive lesser people insane. Though they employ vast resources and requisition almost any forces they see fit, they work most closely with the Grey Knights. When extensive demonic presences are exposed, often only the Brothers of Titan can exercise it. The two bodies often share information, yet maintain a weary eye on each other, in a complex and often strange rapport. The warriors, uh, these inquisitors found, a thousand in number, they were told, and neophytes no longer, were ready to enact the emperor's intent immediately. With their allies in the Inquisition helping to keep secret their existence, uh, the Grey Knights began their hidden war. As a fighting force, only they could face the demon without fear of taint. The existence of such beings and the sorcery used to banish them must forever remain unknown, all witnesses expunged. Titan Titan's frozen landscape of cryo-volcanoes and oceans of liquid methane is broken by jagged spurs of black rock. It is a grim and forbidding place that barely supports basic life. Such barrenness is but one of the veils that shrouds its warriors. Should a ship be allowed anywhere near the surface of Titan, it will already have passed barriers and guards of many kinds. The ship's sensors may have noticed some, such as unusual vessels circling in the dark, as suggested by ghost returns. Those aboard with strange technologies or esoteric powers may feel proud in their detection of yet others, lattices of power that fish for interdimensional prey, or unsleeping stations housing psychic choirs that sing the fort's existence out of people's minds. There are far more layers of diversion, obfuscation and extermination that rival, and in certain ways exceed, those around Terra itself, down to Titan's seemingly lifeless surface. Jutting from the ice sheets in the shadow of Mount Anarch, the citadel of Titan has endured since its raising in a time of legend. It is the fortress monastery of the Grey Knights, and among its black, basalt spires are emplaced batteries of macro cannons and defence lasers. Inside the citadel of Titan's unwelcoming exterior, dusty passages and cavernous halls echo merely to the sweep of robes and the scratch of Nemo quills. Though designed to house an entire chapter, and all the arms and vehicles, serfs and servitors they require, many are the arming chambers, meditation cells and feast halls that lie empty for years. Distance is no obstacle to the demonic threat, and in opposing that threat, most grey knights are scattered, fighting among the stars while the citadel of Titan 
awaits their victorious return. Great walls and columns are engraved with the Grey Knight's battle honours, and grand banners and trophies are hung in the Hall of Champions. In the fortress's depths lie the Chambers of Purity, said to guard, among other horrors, the most sacred or dangerous relics that the Grey Knights recover. Yet the Sons of Titan could not win so many victories were it not for their foresight. Atop the fortress monastery's highest black spire is a single silver pinnacle, the Augerium. Within the mirrored walls of its vaulted chambers, the prognosticars of the Grey Knights sift through their reflected thoughts and douse the shifting strands of timeless probabilities from the warp. Prognosticars are powerful psychers who, among guttering candles and drifts of incense, read psychic tremors and fluctuations to divine the location and time of demonic incursions. Nothing connected with the warp is entirely accurate or safe, but via the prognosticar's careful unpicking of lies, the spore of the demon can be traced. With the visions and wisdom of the prognosticars, uh, the Grey Knights can even be in place before an incursion occurs, rather than wait for the planet's panicked astropathic plea, by which time it is often too late. The Grey Knights anticipate and prepare like no other force of the Imperium, knowing in advance the nature of the threat they face, and perhaps something of the consequences of failure. The Sanctum Sanctorum is secure as only the heart of the Grey Knights could be. This vast, shielded chamber and its countless connected vaults, halls and alcoves contain the accumulated lore of the chapter. The Sanctum Sanctorum's towering shelves of tomes, crumbling scrolls, data crystals and info wafers hold the chapter's forbidden knowledge. The names of prescribed cults and doomed Xenos races can be found here alongside the forged secrets of Nemesis Force Weapons. Details of the chapter's psychic ceremonies and communions uh, set down on stone tablets, hollow discs, or stranger media, uh, shelter in stasis vaults, and in frozen, true-silvered crypts rest the chapter's genetic legacies. The Warp Nexus is a star-shaped chamber at the heart of the Citadel of Titan, and resounds to the ceaseless chants and prayers of hundreds of the chapter's serfs. It is written that the hexagramic sigils and graven designs therein protected Titan and its fortress monastery during their years within the warp, and were even the means of its transition between realms. It is maintained as a tangible artefact, supposedly left by Malkator the Sigilite, but also in the hope that it may once again grant an extreme refuge if needed. The Terminus Decree Deep within the chambers of purity, locked away in the hall said to hold the tomb of the Sigilite himself, rests a wooden box embellished with a golden seal. Within this box, written upon ancient parchment, is the instruction known only as the Terminus Decree. This artefact goes unrecorded in the libraries of the Imperium, for it is kept secret for all but the Supreme Grand Master of the Grey Knights. Only the Supreme Grand Master knows how to open the box, and he will do so only when all hope for the future of humanity seems lost. The Terminus Decree is the ultimate sanction of the Grey Knights, a secret so vast it could bring the Imperium to its knees, or save it in its darkest hour. The exact nature of the document is unknown, for no one has ever opened it, and the only clue to its contents lies in the box's golden seal. It is whispered that it is the exact match of another seal, found only at one sacred spot in all the Imperium's many scattered worlds, the Emperor's Golden Throne. Demon Hunting Demons are not creatures of flesh and blood. They are beings of the darkest myth and madness. To hunt and battle such monsters requires embracing that madness and wielding it as a weapon, fighting sorcery with sorcery. No ordinary human psyche could do so without risking their mind becoming a yawning portal for the demons of chaos to pour through. Grey Knights 
are trained to channel their sanctified powers into a halo of protective wards known as the Ages. Emanating from each Grey Knight's soul, it weaves through enchanted sigils and silver circuitry in their armour, radiating as a nimbus of purity that makes his presence anathema to demon kind. So armoured, Grey Knights can withstand the forbidden powers they must employ to destroy the demon. The Grey Knights have access to weapons that fire ritually engraved bolts, and they wield force weapons that act as energised conduits for the wielder's own psychic powers. Such arms can damage or destroy the quasi-physical shell a demon inhabits once manifested. Chief amongst the Grey Knight's strategies for vanquishing a demon, however, is the knowing of the beast's true name. Such knowledge grants great power, which is why demons adopt misleading titles and why Grey Knights relinquish their birth names upon induction to the chapter. To a Grey Knight, a true name is as reliable a weapon as a storm bolter. A freshly ordained Grey Knight can invoke a true name at a moment's notice to disorient and weaken his foe, while some veterans can employ one to destroy the demon's physical form or even banish it back into the warp. These are not lasting victories, for within the warp a demon may eventually regather its essence and coalesce around its hatred of he who banished it. In their endless war against those that cannot truly be killed, a Grey Knight faces annihilation at every turn. It is the fervent wish of every battle brother that upon his death he be carried back to Titan to be interred in the consecrated crypts of the dead fields. These catacombs have accepted the honoured dead of the chapter since its earliest days. The warrior's body is ritually cleansed and the 666 words of sanctity are inscribed upon his skin before he is laid to rest with honour and solemnity. Chapter Organisation Though recorded as a second founding chapter, the Grey Knights do not follow the Codex Astartes, the great work whose edicts once underpinned the creation of those brotherhoods. Instead, the secretive Grey Knights follow the tenets of structure they believe were handed down by Malkador the Sigilite, tenets born of the unique demands of their war against the Dark Gods. The Grey Knights maintain a strength of approximately a thousand battle brothers. This does not include officers or specialists, and like all Space Marine chapters, the small army of mostly mortal serfs and cybernetic, unthinking servitors that attend the chapter. Unknown to most, the Grey Knights also maintain large bodies of mortal psycho scribes, scholars of the occult, and many more whose hushed whispers, burdened steps or distant chants are heard among candlelit corridors. Hardened against any partial truths they witness, and often mind scrub for safety, these servants help to maintain the citadel of Titan's sanctity against demonic intrusion, amongst many other duties. The bulk of the Grey Knight's Battle Brothers are organised into eight Grand Brotherhoods. Each Brotherhood comprises a notional 100 Grey Knights under the overall authority of its Grand Master and the active leadership of its Brother Captain. His command is usually supported by the Brotherhood's Champion, its Ancient and occasionally other officers. The warriors of each brotherhood are marshalled into squads of ten, each led by an experienced veteran granted the title of Justicar. Each squad is tactically flexible, capable of deploying in missions as half-strength combat squads. Uh, squads remain effective and battle-worthy even when so divided, allowing the brotherhood's commanders to tackle multiple threats as efficiently as possible. Every Grey Knight is trained in the use of the chapter's varied and esoteric weapons and war gear, and in each mission squads deploy with different tactical loadouts and entrusted with varying strategic objectives. The breakdown of squad type in a given situation is determined by the Brotherhood's Grand Master and Brother Captain. It has long been proven, however, that a balance of Terminator and Strike squads, supported by Interceptors and Purgation squads, is by far the most effective combination. 
The Grey Knights are governed and directed by the Chapter Council, made up of the Chapter Lord, also known as the Supreme Grand Master, and the Eight uh, Grand Masters of the Brotherhoods. The Council meet in person rarely, for its members often fight far from Titan. Each member has an equal voice, though the Chapter Lord has the responsibility to pass final judgment. Each Grand Master also holds sway over one of the chapter's constituent bodies, such as its armory or librarians. Each institution is nominally held to form part of his Brotherhood, though he dispatches elements of these organisations to undertake extended duties with others. This authority, only partly ceremonial, is tied to the command of a particular Brotherhood, and over time the Association has informed their fighting style and tactics. The Grey Knights maintain two further fighting bodies and other honoured positions. Answerable directly to the Chapter Council, they accompany forces at the request of the Grand Master. The Order of Purifiers rarely numbers more than 50, and is a cloistered brotherhood with its own traditions, whose spiritually pure warriors are led by the Knights of the Flame. The Paladins are the Chapter's martial elite, a company of some hundred or so of the most skilled warriors, from whose ranks is selected the Grey Knight's most honoured ancient. Chaplains uh, lead the chapter in prayer during gatherings in the Hall of Champions, and it is there also that the wisdom and knowledge of venerable dreadnoughts is often sought. The Grey Knights maintain many of the same specialist roles as other space marines. Librarians exercise greater and more diverse psychic powers than most Grey Knights and help to hone the powers of their battle brothers, Tech Marines have trained with the Tech Priests of Mars, whose techno-religious strictures the Tech Marines balance with the Grey Knight's needs. They maintain the chapter's vehicles and help craft the uh, psychically imbued war gear its warriors wield. Apothecaries, meanwhile, oversee the creation of new Grey Knights with arcane genetic implantation, as well as healing the most terrible of warp-infected injuries and contagions with medicus tools and chirurgical rituals. These warriors are assigned to fight alongside one of the Grey Knight's brotherhoods, often for their entire lives, and in certain cases may even be granted command to lead strikes themselves. They are as embedded in their brotherhood's traditional rites and rituals as all its warriors, and lend their considerable skills uh, to its successful prosecution of the demon. Though assigned to a particular brotherhood, these specialist officers may have completed their training under the auspices of another Grand Master. The chapter's armory, for example, traditionally falls under the rule of the First Brotherhood's Grand Master, and he has ultimate responsibility for the Tech Marine's chapter duties. The Brotherhoods The Brotherhoods of the Grey Knights are at the forefront of the endless war to destroy the demon, wherever it rears its unholy visage. The chapter does not maintain reserve or specialist companies. The grim and exasperating duty before them means that every brotherhood requires the integral means to scour the taint of the warp spawn from any battlefield. At the head of every brotherhood is the Grand Master, each a spiritual successor to the eight founders of the chapter. The Grand Master is responsible for mapping out the never-ending war against the immortal denizens of the warp by whatever means he sees fit. He also maintains his Brotherhood's many alliances, whether among the Chapter's other bodies, with Imperial organisations uh, thought to treat with the Grey Knights, or others with whom the Chapter has especially covert dealings. By consulting with the Chapter's prognosticers and heeding their wisdom, the Grand Master determines where his warriors are most needed. His are decisions that save or condemn billions. Though hundreds, if not thousands of foes may fall before a single one of his hundred or so grey knights, the Grand Master's Brotherhood cannot be everywhere, and not all worlds can be saved. Rather than waste time in his warriors' lives, sometimes the Grand Master must ruthlessly excise failing worlds via the cyclonic warheads of an exterminatus decree. The Grand Master is not solely a strategist, but also a paragon of martial might. His presence on the battlefield is an indicator of the severity of the foe being faced. He leads the fight in the most perilous battles, while in the deployment and command of his brotherhood, 
he is supported by his experienced brother captain. The brother captain has operational authority of the Brotherhood. It is he who determines how the Grand Master's wider strategy is enacted. The brother captain's place on the battlefield is at the very heart of the fighting, where he stands shoulder to shoulder with his Brotherhood, as blazing psychic fire bursts from his armoured fingertips. The brother captain has honed his empiric powers so that he can maintain psychic contact with each of his warriors even in the thickest fighting, adapting his tactics and battle lines with precision and subtlety. This allows him to respond to emergent threats far more swiftly than many Imperial commanders. The senior warriors of the brother captain's command often fight alongside him. The Brotherhood's champion is an exemplar of the divine martial prowess to which all Grey Knights aspire. In suits of artifice of wrought armour and wielding the signature sword that echoes the chapter's icon, the Brotherhood champion defends his captain with peerless skill and stands ready to die in his commander's stead. To the Brotherhood ancient, meanwhile, is entrusted one of the Brotherhood's sacred standards, taken down from the Hall of Champions on Titan and reverently carried into battle. In its shadow, his brothers are roused to even greater feats of heroism, and the ancient invokes the names and deeds recorded on the banner in the darkest moments of conflict. The Grey Knights often fight the most hellish of battles over maddening landscapes, as warp fire blazes and the screams and whispers of demons fill the air. The Grey Knights strengthen their psychic communion. By the invocation of mystic rites and the intoning of ritualized chants and the heat of battle, the warriors steal their souls and sharpen their blades. The Justicars, who lead each squad, hone their warriors' empiric talents and provide a focus for their powers. Every battle brother learns not only to fight with all kinds of specialised weapons, armour and war gear, but also the rights associated with each pattern of tactical operation his squad could be expected to fight in. In other chapters, a Terminator armour is a rare and precious resource restricted to their elite. It is a measure of the Grey Knight's vital duty that they maintain enough suits to equip their entire chapter, should they wish. Secure in suits of bonded ceramite and hardened exoskeletons, Terminator squads have been known to fight for weeks on end against demonic hordes. They scythe down swathes of lighter enemies with tempests of explosive ammunition before cleaving apart far larger creatures with nemesis force weapons attuned to the wielder's unique powers. So armoured, a grey knights storm fleshy citadels, battle inside raging firestorms and hunt their foe in the labyrinths of space hulks. More lightly armoured, strike squads wear suits of artifice of wrought power armour engraved with sigils of sanctity. They are often tasked before battle with the reconnaissance of sites that may have been hidden even from the prognosticators or sorcerous lairs too cramped to admit the bulk of their Terminator brothers. The Sixth Brotherhood frequently rely on strike squads' surgical strikes uh, to divert and disrupt enemy assaults, before using their psychic augmentation to attack as part of the killing strike. The more heavily armed Purgation squads uh, wield multiple heavy weapons virtually unknown to the wider Imperium. These squads employ their powers to pierce the warp, perceiving threats through layers of deception. Some purgators uh, gaze into their foes' futures, seeing so clearly where they will be that they make virtually impossible shots. Grey Knights are often heavily outnumbered, but supported by purgators, uh, that isn't the case for long. Many Grey Knights' attacks are characterised by the flare of teleportation strikes, their warriors especially fortified against the Immaterium's touch. Interceptor squads brave repeated warp transitions to rapidly redeploy and intone carefully measured rites that flow between the squad's minds. These allow them to achieve incredible harmonies of empiric coordination their luckless and shocked enemies will never know. Chamber of Trials it is from the Chamber of Trials that the Company of Gatherers set out across the galaxy in search of recruits. 
The gatherers are grey knights whose great age or crippling injuries no longer permit them to undertake the primary work of the chapter, but whose keen minds can winnow out the most suitable aspirants. From among the throngs of prospective candidates, their recruitment harvests trawl, the gatherers select those whose potential is strongest. There are few limits to the harvester's remit in their long hunts. They scour many likely sources of recruits, barbaric worlds with no ken of the Imperium, the black ships that collect tithes of psychers, civilised worlds of billions where they work via emissaries ignorant of the Grey Knights, even the recruitment worlds of other space marine chapters, commonly without their knowledge. The Chamber of Trials is where aspirants arrive and their training begins. Even those whose suitable talent and purity are detected by the gatherers will be weeded out if their fortitude is found wanting. The knowledge and gene seed a Grey Knight receives, known as the Emperor's Gift, is too valuable to risk wasting, and barely one in a thousand survives the first rite of passage, the pilgrimage through the haunted plains of Xanadu Regio. Most who do are slain in the second rite, during which they must trek through the pitch-black, glaphite-stalked caverns beneath Ganessa Macula. Many more trials await, and a fraction of novitiates make it through the physical and mental challenges to be deemed worthy of receiving the Emperor's gift and beginning the transformation to Grey Knight. Chapter Apothecaries, aided by psi-bonded serfs and medice servitors, implant the chapter's novitiates with the Grey Knight's unique organs in the lowest levels of the Chamber of Trials. Once these agonising procedures are complete, the novitiate is ordained as a neophyte and his true training begins. Unlike those of most chapters, a Grey Knight neophytes do not serve in battle, for they must endure many years of martial and mental preparation before they can face the most dangerous foe of Titan's sons. A neophyte's skills are sharpened by the Brotherhood champions and his psychic powers honed by the librarians. He must also perform the rituals of detestation that harden his heart against the lies and temptations of demons. Should he pass these final challenges, the neophyte will be raised to the rank of knight and take his place in the fight against chaos. First, Brotherhood. The Sword Bearers. The Grand Master of the First holds the title of Steward of the Armory, with nominal guardianship of the chapter's tech marines who maintain and administer the chapter's engines of war. The First Brotherhood regularly undertake hammer blow strikes with great numbers of the chapter's reserves of land raiders, storm hawk interceptors, and storm talon and storm raven gunships. As such, the sword bearers are often called upon when the Grey Knights require armoured or aerial support, and in their ranks are many of the finest pilots of the chapter. Many of the chapter's tech marines fight alongside the First Brotherhood after completing their training, fulfilling their battlefield duties under the same Grand Master who oversees their wider commitments to the chapter's sacred fighting vehicles. The Battle Brothers of the Sword Bearers are drilled to fight in perfect unison with these hallowed war machines, shattering the ranks of the enemy to allow barrages of Stormstrike missiles and Godhammer las cannon fire to blast apart towering greater demons as they manifest from the warp onto the battlefield. The Sword Bearers were last reported across six war zones in Segmentum Tempestus, hunting dark magi and their warp forges in sectors adjacent to the Siren Storm. These infernal factorums churn out demon engines, and far worse, but the Brotherhood's armoured strikes have already exercised free of these sights. The Second Brotherhood The Blades of Victory The Blades of Victory have a well-deserved reputation for rapid deployment and swift strikes, even by the standards of the Grey Knights. The Brotherhood makes use of large numbers of interceptor and strike squads, using mass teleportation tactics to outmaneuver their enemies. The second is often the vanguard of combined Brotherhood assaults, bursting onto the battlefield to form a beachhead and seeding the way for heavier troops to follow. 
As Admiral of the fleet, the Grand Master of the Second excels at the art of military manoeuvres and formation, ensuring the Grey Knight's rapid deployment to a war zone. With the predictions of the prognosticers uh, providing vital tactical information, Grey Knight strike cruisers and battle barges uh, deploying elements of the Second Brotherhood are often able to deliver forces to the battlefield before the foe has even made its arrival. The current Grand Master, Vorf Mordrake, is said to be circled by the psychic echoes of the Fallen, uh, given deftly form by his innate powers. Though he has sworn to find the reason for the ghostly presences, uh, the greater mission of the chapter always comes first. Uh, currently, Mordrake uh, is leading the Blades of Victory through the systems of the uh, Dever Consortium, a trading empire in the Imperium Nihilus. Mordrake's swift ships and preternatural assaults have shut down many of the networks spreading the Gellapox contagion, but more remain, and a gestalt sentience stirs. Third, Brotherhood. The Wardmakers. The Third Brotherhood are perhaps the most well-known Brotherhood, uh, so to speak. The, the majority of the Imperium is still completely unaware of the Grey Knight's existence, of course. The Third Brotherhood of the Grey Knights have won triumphant victories in some of the most dire episodes ever withheld from the Imperial records. The breadth of forbidden knowledge they maintain has aided the banishment of the deadliest demons and the Brotherhood's ancient association with the chapter's librarians see the Wardmakers uh, boast more erudition than any other. The Wardmakers undertake scholarly research during the brief moments between fighting and martial training. The Brotherhood delve into tomes of lore amassed fraction by fraction over the millennia. They learn to craft psychic adjurations with their minds that reject the enslaving psychic yokes of demons. Many master the rites by which they project their own purifying auras. Some have even become experts in isolating heretics from demonic overlords that seek to corrupt them further with tainted whispers, severing the foul connections between them. Successive Grand Masters have taught that demons can be defeated with broad and diverse knowledge, for those creatures ever rely on deceit, misdirection and falsehoods. A battle brother of the Wardmakers does not neglect his martial skill in any way, however, honing them under the stern gaze of the Brotherhood's learned champion. Only when he can intone the 666 verses of the Kabbalos Lumina without pause or error, as the champion and a dozen lunar class combat services attack the battle brother en masse, is he satisfied? As every Grand Master has an equal voice within the Chapter Council, so every Brotherhood is equal. Though their associations and methods may differ, none is held above another. It is without doubt, however, that the Wardmakers have been pivotal in defeating the forces of chaos in countless terrible events. Had but one of these hidden battles been lost, mankind's future may have been far darker. When a mysterious infection descended on the Decimala system, it was the wise counsel of the Third's Grand Master at the time, Valdor Orican, that revealed a Zenchian demon's machinations at its heart. With careful assessment of the prognosticers' readings, the Emperor's tarot, and ancient prophecies, he uncovered the disease's implications and its threads of fate. All of this showed it for the titanic threat it truly was, a plague of madness that would have spread without end. On Calva V, the Wardmakers faced demons of all four chaos gods in an incursion that spilled towards the Segmentum Fortress at Cipramundi. The Brotherhood faced legions of demon engines too, and possessed husks that were all that was left of the former populace. The Third Brotherhood drew deep from their vast knowledge, crafting sorceries that were tailored to every foul iteration of demon crawling up before them. For no one sanctified blast could have cut through all the differing forms. It was under the nascent command of Grand Master Voldus that the Third Brotherhood stood side by side with the Ultramarines on Macrag. Their empiric powers threw back chaos sorcery during the Siege of Hera, and ensured the successful resurrection of the Primarch, Rebute Gilliman. Alderic Valdus Grandmaster Valdus wields more psychic might 
than any grey knight seen in centuries. Where he strides into battle, the air grows heavy with empiric charges, and he unleashes his powers in waves of purifying flame that scour the foe before him. His relic demon hammer, the Malleus Argiorum, was crafted over the course of a century by the blind smith Hulliver. Thrumming as Valdus feeds psychic power into its arcane core, the Grand Master wields it as if it weighs nothing at all, and his attacks strike with the force of a thunderbolt. His elevation to the vaunted position of Grand Master of the Third Brotherhood came during the onset of the Great Rift's apocalyptic emergence. Though his ennoblement uh, came from the lips of Lord Caldor Drago himself in the wake of their combined banishment of a Zentian demonic lord, it is one that sits heavily with Valdus. He sees himself as a humble warrior who sought no great advancement uh, within the organisation than a position from which to slay the hated demon. Yet he swore to Lord Drago an oath to live up to the honour, and on the crag, on Gathalamor Prime, on Luna and Holy Terror itself, among many others, Aldric Valdus has proven, at least to others, his supreme ability, strength and will. As well as commanding Brotherhood of the most elite space marines, Valdus is Warden of the Librarius. In this capacity, he has authority over the chapter's librarians and the dangerous archives of knowledge that they guard. Arvin Stern Amongst the Grey Knight's ranks, Brother Captain Stern stands as one of the longest-serving and most decorated. On Atraxis, Stern led the counterattack that culled the cult of the Red Talon. He alone cornered Makashin, the Lord of Change that enslaved them, and banished the screaming demon back to the warp. In a psychic feat, thought beyond the capacity of a lone Brother Captain. So began a vendetta of centuries in which Macashin has seemed to interfere in the redoubtable brother captain's fate. For each of Stern's heroic feats, some dire misfortune befalls his allies. Since Atraxis, the demon has haunted his steps. Each time they have fought, Macashin has managed to flee, killing many of Stern's battle brothers before he does so. Yet with each confrontation, Stern learns more of his demonic nemesis, as, no doubt, the demon believes it learns more of him in turn. Stern has refused any advancement until the threat of Macashin can be ended forever. When the demon overreaches itself, so Stern has sworn, it will be his blade that avenges his fallen brothers. Every Grey Knight is a psyker, a bearer of mutation that sets him as much apart from other space marines as his genetically enhanced body sets him apart from humanity. But few of the chapter's battle brothers exercise this power with free reign. Even for a grey knight, this would offer a way into the material realm for insatiable demons. It is the librarians who train their brothers to focus their psychic gifts in concert with others of their squad. The chapter's librarians are experts in the use of their powers. They are capable of invoking all manner of diverse incantations. These they build up over centuries of arcane study and mental duels with creatures from the warp. Librarians are assigned to fight alongside one of the Brotherhoods, supporting their brother Grey Knights on the battlefield and offering counsel on matters of obscure lore. As part of controlling their own powers, librarians are skilled in resisting the insidious influences of the war. They wear complex cowls, amalgams of crystal and neural wiring that empower them in tearing apart the sorceries of others. Librarians maintain ancient rites or ranks, the origins of which are uncertain. As he rises through the hierarchy, from Lexicanum to Codicia and thence Epistolary, the librarian is judged stronger in mind. It becomes more capable of wielding dangerous power and is granted access to some of the darkest mysteries held by the chapter. Librarium Demonica Located deep in the Sanctum Sanctorum lies the Librarium Demonica. It is one of the most heavily shielded and guarded locations in the Imperium, for here lies the Grey Knight's corpus of knowledge on demon kind. Some of the lore predates the Imperium, or has been obtained from long-dead Xenos races, and some is reputed to have been dictated by Malkador, or even the Emperor himself. 
The threat of such knowledge falling into the wrong hands is not underestimated. The Librarium de Monica lies behind free adamantine barriers, each many yards thick, protected by enchantments, anointed with consecrated oils and etched with silver seals of warding. Elder librarians guard each of the three massive portals, the gateways sealed with layers of arcane ciphers, spatial displacers and magical vortices. Any seeking entrance, who does not utter the secret words of passage at the ritualized moments, will be destroyed by the guardian librarians without pause. Among the dread knowledge contained within are the true names of many of the foulest demons and the known instances of their manifestations. One, the demon known as Macashin, is unpleasantly familiar to the third's brother captain, for its fate and his are inextricably linked. The third have recently been engaged with Magnus the Red on the planet of sorcerers. Though it cost the Brotherhood dearly, Brother Captain Stern was hailed for his actions on the planet of sorcerers that halted a fell ritual of Magnus the Red. Yet the Wardmakers do not rest. They continue to incinerate demonic incursions that flare up as the taint of Magnus's world seeps outwards. Fourth Brotherhood, the Prescient Brethren. The Keeper of the Orgarium commands the Fourth Brotherhood, and within its ranks are many of the chapter's most potent psychers, warriors with an instinctual understanding of the warp that goes beyond even that of their peers. It is from the prescient brethren that many prognosticers are often chosen, yet only if they have shown particular aptitude and are considered too valuable an asset to risk on the battlefield. Members of the prescient brethren often have the ability to sense danger before it materialises, and they use this to stalk their enemy relentlessly, and to devise highly effective ambushes in which to snare their foe. Such abilities are of the utmost value when combating demons, creatures whose timeless and unnatural existences allow many to manipulate the strands of fate, as well as races such as the meddlesome Eldar, or Eldari. The ability to anticipate their enemies' manoeuvres also enhances their martial abilities, and some of the greatest duelists in the chapter's history have come from the prescient brethren. Few are the swordsmen whose skill can outmatch empiric foreknowledge. Following the prophecies of the prognosticers, elements of the prescient brethren led a series of preemptive purges against Eldar or Eldari conclaves thought to have links to the so-called Gnari or Nari or Yinari, however you say it, cults, in which the Brotherhood detected the fateful patterning of convergent demonic invocation. Fifth Brotherhood, the Preservers. The responsibility of the chapter's greatest legacy, its gene seed, lies with the Grand Master of the Fifth, for it is under his auspices that the apothecaries are trained in their vital duties. Not only that, but as protectors of the Sanctum Sanctorum, his is the responsibility for the preservation of numerous strands of knowledge, including the unique technological and historical law housed there. The living embodiments of much of this data are the Grey Knights' dreadnoughts, in which uh, former warriors too injured uh, to be healed continue to serve. To be the Grand Master of the Fifth, in many ways the Warden of these ancients, requires great humility, for many dreadnoughts house battle brothers with experience dating back millennia. By tradition, Fallen warriors, newly entombed inside Dreadnought's sarcophagi, often fight alongside the Fifth while they learn uh, through combat how to wield the raw power of their machine spirit. Where the Preservers battle, their strategies are often centred on these honoured ancients. The ground shakes beneath pounding iron feet as the fury of these deathless war machines is brutally released upon those before them. Uh, currently, Half the Fifth Brotherhood have been dispatched to purify the taint of Tramutaha the Voidmoor, a warp entity festering with its fell kin in the drifting space hulk Vector of Ruin. The remainder, under Grand Master Morvens, are following a desperate series of visions 
as they race to reach the Neckman gauntlet in time. Sixth, Brotherhood, the Rapiers. The Grey Knights do not tolerate wasted effort or manpower, and in the history-making deliberations of the Chapter Council, it is often the High Seneschal of the Fortress who is tasked with crafting the most elite and deadly strike forces. Those who serve as High Seneschal are stringent taskmasters, their dedication to excellence and efficiency reflected in the warriors of their brotherhood. The rapiers are exemplars in the creation of strategically deployed, purpose-built strike forces, able to inflict as much damage as far larger armies. Rather than using destructive orbital bombardments and mass teleportation, the rapiers rely on surgical strikes, trusting the training and expertise of small squads of specialists to get the job done. Where bulk of numbers is necessary, the Grand Master, or his brother Captain, deploys mindless servitors to bog down the enemy, allowing his Grey Knights to focus on high-risk targets. Records, kept solely within the Citadel of Titan, even reveal the expert yet ruthless factoring of other unsuspecting Imperial forces into some of the Rapier's most finely executed strikes. If such... Loss is lauded as noble sacrifice, and so be it. The rapier's peerless reputation for precision is relied upon to cleanse the maze-like fortifications of Barante currently. Unknown to the treacherous regiments stationed there, or their Xenos Tau paymasters, Barante's ancient earthworks hold back the warp in this region. A severe damage would damn the entire system. The Seventh Brotherhood the Exactors. The Inquisition and the Grey Knights were founded, according to some sources, around the same time. Though created to act independently of one another, many goals of the two orders broadly align. The Exactors have a long history of acting upon information supplied by the Ordo Malleus, occasionally alongside them. As a result, respected Inquisitors are often able to call upon them for aid. It is through the Grand Master, as representatives to the Inquisition, that contact usually flows. In return, the Exactors expect the Inquisition to provide watchful eyes throughout the Imperium and to supply them with auxiliary forces whenever and wherever they request them. The Seventh Brotherhood sometimes fights alongside Imperial troops, requisitioned by the Inquisition, utilising platoons of Astra Militarum soldiers to hold key battlefield positions or inquisitorial acolytes to quell demonic uprisings. Those brave troops who survive their missions with the Exactors and somehow avoid the inquisitorial purges that follow continue to serve the chapter as mind-scoured servitors, as long as their biological components retain their integrity. Currently, in response to an encrypted missive from the Ordo Malleus, the Seventh Brotherhood are tracking down the radical inquisitor Ray Yularen. The dangerous genius has surrounded himself with a small empire of requisition troops, as well as inquisitorial operatives and Xenos agents. Yet it is his demon hosts that will damn him. And finally, the Eighth Brotherhood, the Silver Blades. When a newly forged battle brother joins the ranks of the Grey Knights, he will typically be sequestered to the Ape Brotherhood. He may then find a place within one of the other brotherhoods, uh, depending on his natural talents and the favour of the Grand Masters, or he may choose to remain with the Silver Blades. Those who remain dedicate themselves to continual training, running the trials of initiation again and again in pursuit of martial perfection. Led by the Knight Commander of Recruits, the Warriors of the Eighth fight in fluid configurations, changing tactics swiftly during combat and between engagements. Any available weapon is put to use, and no strategy or manoeuvre is preferred over any other. A Silver Blade aims to be proficient in the use of every armament, and to know the strengths in every strike force, and weakness in every enemy. It is the Grand Master of the Eighth that the Company of Gatherers and their Master also report, and the Silver Blades ever look out for survivors who appear unusually determined and free of taint. 
Such individuals regularly pique the interests of the Inquisition as well, and debates on the length of their future run hot. The Chambers of Purity The Chambers of Purity are thought to be the oldest part of the Citadel of Titan. They lie deep, buried like a secret in the dark and the cold far beneath the moon's surface. Though the Chambers of Purity and their sanctified guardians are hidden away, it is to ensure the securing of something deeper and darker, a secret they are placed there to guard. The chapter's legends tell that a great evil lies entombed among the roots of Mount Anarch, the great peak at whose base the Grey Knight's Fortress Monastery sits. To those Grey Knights with just cause to approach the outer entrances of the Chamber of Purity, strange echoes and air patterns suggest some vast space beyond. Not even the Grand Masters know the full truth. Many rumours, terrifying if only for the grim credence such learned and stoic warriors would give them, have wound around the mystery down the millennia. Some have it that it is an evil intrinsic to Titan, that it is the reason the moon was chosen as the Grey Knight's homeworld. Some of those conjecture that it was there already, while others that the Emperor placed it there, something he would not or could not destroy. Still, others have talked of some failure in the warp nexus, that during Titan's timeless period within the warp, something defeated Malkador's wards and crept into the heart of Titan itself. Only the Iron Grimoire is believed to disclose the truth. Within its bindings of screaming warp metal, this tome is said to liken the bedrock of Titan to a graven tomb, and the chambers of purity to that tomb's capstone. Thus, the chambers are less of a prison and more like that prison's lock and key. Only the supreme Grand Master is permitted to read the Iron Grimoire. Of all other Grey Knights, only the Chamber's guardians, the Order of Purifiers, truly know what it is they guard. Yet when the Rock of Titan shakes and the Purifiers seal the approaches to their chambers, the chapter holds its collective breath until the tremors end. Since the emergence of the Great Rift, the shivering of Titan's innards have grown more frequent and more intense. Chapter numerologers have reported disturbing synergies in the quake's frequencies, and other visionaries have spoken with fear of a great awakening, the opening of an eye. This evil, though perhaps the greatest on Titan, is far from the only one kept safe by the chambers of purity. Within Fortified oubliettes, stasis donjons, and refraction prisons, all part of the chamber's lattice of secure sanctums, lie the demonic relics kept by the chapter. These are the profane objects deemed too hazardous to be studied or displayed as trophies in the Hall of Champions. Yet they are also too dangerous to be destroyed, for that would allow the baleful demons bound within to return to the warp where they would coalesce once more at their malignant leisure. These catalogues, instructions, ravings, histories, and every kind of tome, scroll, and creaking liber can be found here, their pages, bindings, and inks formed of a thousand substances, few of them given willingly. Bones are there too, of fallen saints, and enslaving prophet hawkers, of possessed Xenos tyrants, such as those of the Whisperer, who was unearthing by a greed-driven Inquisitor, brought about the plague of madness. Tainted energies in grave suspension, Xenos technologies and mechanical idols from darker ages languish in bonds, their sentiences raging or else repeating unheeded pleas of innocence. Blades... Hooks, maces, strangely proportioned firearms and countless other forms of life-taker are sequestered in gilded caskets. These demon weapons have tasted blood and souls and are some of the chamber's most dangerous occupants. Their will kept dormant by the workings of ancient technology and the powerful radiance of the chamber's keepers. The Purifiers are an organisation apart from other Grey Knights, Distanced from their battle brothers by their nature and tradition, they guard the chamber of purity against mortal and immortal incursion, ensuring nothing and no one breaches their realm to reach the mountain's roots beyond. Only the Grand Masters of the Brotherhood 
and the chapter lord are permitted within their domain unbidden. They're not at all any further. They have the authority and determination to destroy any who are not permitted. In the rare instances of intruders, none have returned, their fate remaining unknown and unquestioned. The purifiers epitomise the chapter's sanctity of purpose. There is neither training regime nor set process by which a grey knight joins their dour and taciturn ranks. Membership of the Order of Purifiers is not granted through skill, valour or a tally of grim deeds, and a grey knight may serve with unblemished distinction throughout his functionally immortal lifetime without being granted this singular honour. Rather, purifiers recruit only those grey knights whose souls are held to be utterly incorruptible, even beyond the usual exacting standards of the chapter. So painstaking is the selection, and so rarely bestowed, that there are seldom more than a few score of purifiers. Whether it be some quirk of mystical fate, however, their numbers seldom drop so low as to render their duties unfulfilled. Thus, never has thought been given to relaxing the restrictions of induction, lest the sanctity of the order be compromised. On rare occasion, the head of the purifier order will accept a request from one of the Grand Masters for the aid of a portion of their warriors. Only one of the Council can make such a demand, understanding the gravity of the purifier's duty. Even whilst not knowing its true nature, a Grand Master does so only in the direst of circumstances. When purifiers deploy, they often form the chapter's spearhead in war zones, that boil and churn with legions of demons. The purifier's untarnished spirit is not only their defining characteristic, it is also their greatest weapon. Like the light of battle said to halo the Imperium's greatest saints, a nimbus of radiance illuminates these pure warriors. Combined with a grey knight's formidable psychic might, this inviolability of heart and mind is transformed into a cleansing azure fire, that burns unworthy adversaries in body and soul. Little resists the power of this glorious conflagration. A demon's cold malignancy is turned violently against it. A corrupted soldier's fears erupt into a corona of fire, and the malevolence of predatory Xenos consumes such aliens. None but the purifiers walk unharmed through this blaze, armour gleaming as they dispatch their charred foes. Castellan Crow. Garen Crow, the champion of the Order of Purifiers, is both its head and its guiding spirit. He is, by any measure of the Grey Knights, a flawless soul, so resistant to the wiles of chaos as to be thought immune to them. It is to the keeping of this paragon that the chapter entrusts one of its most heinous possessions, the Black Blade of Antwerp. The Black Blade is a weapon of singular power. The entity bound within it had yoked the minds of previous wielders, making bloody war with its slave and their armies in thrall to its will across entire sectors. Though it would disappear for centuries at a time, fleeing with its slave into the warp, the Grey Knights finally slew its bearer and captured it. The Blade of Antwer alas, proved so powerful that no craft of the Grey Knights could destroy it. Its corruptive potential was deemed too great even for the chambers of purity to contain permanently. Perhaps its insistent whispers might infect others on Titan or beyond. It was seen that the safest prison was the constant grasp of the purifier's champion. From one of these epitomies of sanctity to the next it has passed and is now in the iron grip of Castellan Crow. The blade whispers, cajoles and screams constantly, promising undreamt power and threatening vile abasement in a voice only Crow can hear. At times, it has even offered up aid to him as he faced one of his demonic rivals. Crow must forever be on his guard. When not beset by the mortals and demons drawn to its influence, the Castellan must do psychic battle with the blade itself. He listens not to a word of its lies and never responds to its temptations. Unto death, he is its guardian, not its slave. Hall 
of champions. Among rows of iron-bound basal columns, rising to vaulted arches far above the central hall of champions, hang the standards and trophies of the Grey Knights. Dark statues stare down, their stern countenances underlit by consecrated candles. Along with subsidiary chancels and council chambers, the hall forms the chapter's martial and spiritual heart. The huge central chamber of the Citadel of Titan is known as the Hall of Champions, though in truth this term stretches to encompass a warren of chambers, passages and sanctuaries that lead from the central hall's tiered levels. Here are held rare feasts when more than a handful of grey knights are upon Titan together. These are often in the wake of a hard-fought victory, the Battle Brothers within the Fortress Monastery recovering and rearming before the next vision of doom calls them to war once more. Ranks of statues regard ceremonial proceedings. Oaths are sometimes sworn directly to them. They depict the Grey Knight's ancestors, chapter heroes granted a form of immortality in which to inspire those who take up the fight after them. The hall is also a place in which to honour living heroes. Investitures and ordinations take place within circles of adjuration, inlaid into the solid floor in silver. Trophies, taken from the defeated, are displayed on sigil-carved iron hooks and chains. These may be shattered weapons, fragments of sigh-scorched armour, or stranger items, like the thirteen twisted iron masks of the demon Magi, purged from Sebrum II. Perhaps most unusual of all is the skull of Iramneth, the demon Raja of Nalu. Before the defeated creature's spirit could flee to the warp, the Grey Knights bound it into its flayed skull. Now its fading sentience rages silently and impotently, forced to witness the celebration of the Grey Knights' every triumph over chaos. Though the Grey Knights' prime concern is the demonic menace, they fight countless battles against the alien, mutant and heretic, and many trophies in the hall stand as testament to these victories. The Hall of Champions is the seat of the Paladins, the Grey Knights' greatest warrior squads, and many of the statues there represent former companions of the Paladins' fraternity. As the Order of Purifiers stand as the Grey Knights' sanctified elite, the Paladins are the chapter's martial exemplars. If a Grey Knight wishes to prove himself worthy of a place amongst such a lauded elite, bravery and skill at arms are not enough. He must complete eight quests to establish his character and cause, each more arduous and deadly than the last. They culminate in the hunting down and banishment of one of the 666 most powerful demons known to have manifested. Battle Brothers have died on these quests, refusing to abandon them and incur grave dishonour. It is a measure of the paladin's status that a grey knight seeking admission is willing to risk depriving his chapter of his skills, that he may serve it to a higher standard. The paladins seldom fight as one body. The supreme grand master, or one of the council in his stead, call upon the paladins when they require the very best of the chapter to take to the field, and they are usually dispatched in small numbers to support individual brotherhoods. Truly selfless, yet with the skill to destroy the foulest beasts, paladins throw themselves without hesitation into combat with towering demon lords and murderous hordes of warpspawn. The sacred standards and banners that hang in the Hall of Champions represent every brotherhood and order of the Grey Knights. They honour the cleansing of worlds and the purging of unhallowed evil. There are few in the Imperium that know of such heroics, and fewer still who record them. Each brotherhood maintains many standards in the Hall, and here also are displayed the personal banners and relics of fallen heroes. The Paladin's Ancient has been chosen from amongst that exemplar brotherhood for his reverence and stoicism. In his unshakable grasp is carried one of the chapter's greatest standards, one that depicts the Grey Knight's most glorious victories over demon kind. His is a duty more personal than that of many ancients, 
for he has fought in many of these great victories, and is as much a figure of inspiration as the banner he lifts. It is against the stirring backdrop of these standards that the chapter's chaplains lead their brotherhoods in prayer during the greatest gatherings in the Hall of Champions, as they also do before battle. Chaplains are the spiritual leaders of the Grey Knights. They maintain many of the chapter's traditions and inculcate neophytes in the strictures they must know before acceptance, as well as mercilessly administering punishments to those who they perceive as wavering in their focus. Their fiery sermons, shouted over the din of battle, are intoned with grim solemnity in the hall, reminding those among whom they fight of the price of failure, psychically reinforcing the heavy duty laid upon them all by the Emperor. Caldor Drago At the Grand Master's high table in the Hall of Champions, the place of honour has sat empty since before the opening of the Cicitrix Maledictum. Chapter Lord Caldor Drago, the Supreme Grand Master, passed beyond the sight of the chapter on the world of Acrillium. Two hundred years later, Drago defeated the demon Makar, the reborn there, and the creature had sworn its revenge. This time, however, as Drago cast the self-same demon into a warp rift, the creature's spite was not done with him. Screeching a curse two centuries in the making, Makar's taloned claws dragged Lord Drago into the warp with it. If Makar had hoped Drago's soul would become a tortured plaything for the denizens of the warp, he had underestimated the Supreme Grand Master. In a way which is still not understood, Drago survived. His mind and his spirit, hardened against the essence of chaos over long years, helped him endure where perhaps no other man could. The Chapter Lord wandered for a timeless age, defeating and crushing every demon that dared threaten him, rejecting temptations and madness, and hardening his will to survive. Yet real space was not done with Drago. On Justero, a heretical warp ritual caused him to be drawn back. There he fought alongside warriors of his chapter once more, but at the battle's end, he could not save himself from sliding back into the warp. Thus has been his fate ever since, drawn back and forth for unknowable periods, fighting endless demons in both realms. Yet his chapter know that he lives, and in many battles his sudden appearance has swung victory for the Grey Knights. The Grey Knights wield some of the finest and most advanced weapons in the Imperium. They are wrought with the arcane and the occult, with rituals that the uninitiated might fanatically condemn as sham spiritualism or vile witchery. The Grey Knights know with chilling intimacy the difference and the need to employ every weapon in their unending war with the demon. Upon the inception of the Grey Knights, it was recognised that this necessarily secretive and embattled chapter must have greater control over the production of its materials. A pact was forged with the Tech Priests of Mars, instigated with self-deleting protocols. Via archaeological means no longer known to the Adeptus Mechanicus, Mars's moon of Deimos was moved out of its Martian orbit and transferred to Titan. Now, the heavily industrialised forges of Deimos are thunder night and day to produce battle tanks, gunships, energy cells, combustion cores, and far more, including huge quantities of ammunition from bolt shells to the titanic ordnance required by starships. Deimos's manufactorums even produce some of the components for the Grey Knight's rare or unique weapons, though measures are taken to ensure the tech priests cannot learn anything prescribed. These are delivered through cloistered means to the Grey Knight's armory on Titan. It is here that the chapter's tech marines oversee their assembly and manage their ritual embellishment. After his inculcation in the mysteries of the tech priest cult of the machine god, a tech marine stands somewhat apart from his brothers. Few of the cult's doctrines are compatible with those of the Grey Knights. Thus, a tech marine must balance the two sides of his nature to serve the goals of the Grey Knights, but according to the traditions of the Adeptus Mechanicus. The chapter's goals override all else, however, 
and though adjustments they must make to holy constructs go against the tenets of Mars, tech marines know the foe their chapter faces in a way tech priests never will. While steeped in aspects of their cult, tech marines owe no loyalty to Mars, and the chapter council relies upon them to guard against the red planet, learning more than is good for it. There are many esoteric technologies employed in the ember-lit and strangely shifting smoke of Titan's armory. Psych-out grenades are produced using a substance thought by some to be a by-product of the processes that sustain the Astronomicon. Each of these explosives scatters a dense cloud of psi-refractive particles that can excruciate those who draw upon the warp's powers or even fracture their fragile connection to the Empyrean. The Grey Knights willingly carry to battle such devices so dangerous to themselves speaks of the selflessness by which they undertake their duty. Bolt weapons are advanced and powerful firearms whose difficulty to manufacture and ferocious recoil uh, limit their use to the Imperium's martial elite. Bolts are small missiles, large-bore, rapid-firing, armor-piercing shells. Each houses a mass-reactive tip that triggers an explosive once the bolt has penetrated its target, inflicting crater-like wounds. Reliable and robust, they are endowed with a legendary status among the space marines with whom they are frequently associated, and the Grey Knights are no exception. The Sons of Titan commonly bear specialised Vambrace-mounted storm bolters with twin barrels. They allow Grey Knights to fire streams of bolts at high volume via mined impulse units and simultaneously wield their deadly nemesis weapons with two hands. Larger bolt weapons are commonly mounted onto Razorback transports and the indomitable Land Raider battle tanks. Elements of bolt technology are also employed in the ancient design of Psy cannons. Extremely rare, the secrets of their creation have been lost by a great number of forge worlds. The Grey Knights are among the few with the strength of mind and will to activate the silver-tipped and psychically charged munitions that Psy cannons fire. In an entire chapter of warp-harnessing warriors, Psy cannons are not the only empirically imbued weapons. Most Grey Knights carry a force weapon attuned to their will. These nemesis weapons are crafted by the chapter's tech marines. They are varied in form and unique in nature. From paired falchions and long-hafted halberds to immense demon hammers and protective warding staves, each is an arcane forging of iron, silver, crystalline matrices and psychic circuitry. The ritual of dedication binds the weapon to its bearer, and through this link he channels his psychic might. The wielder's empiric strength makes ancient runes of demon slaying upon the weapon burn with a sanctified inner fire, adding to the power of the weapon's advanced disruptor field. After years of battle, a Grey Knight's force weapon retains part of his psyche imprinted upon its killing edges that will live on long after he has fallen, thereby making it an honoured ancestor weapon of the chapter. Among their unusual war gear are some whose technology the chapter sources outside the Imperium or whose supply is arranged by segregated cells of the Order Malleus. The Grey Knights remain threateningly taciturn on such matters, though some Inquisitors believe that silencers may originate down such unorthodox avenues. Silencers and their kind do not possess physical triggering mechanisms. They are activated when their wielder sends a bolt of psychic force into the weapon's containment chamber. The Grey Knight's empiric power is channeled by a series of focusing crystals and then unleashed as a punishing blast of azure psychic lances. With grim practicality, the Grey Knights acknowledge that the most monstrous warp spawn, uh, the greater demons of chaos, often wield far more power than a single battle brother could hope to overcome. Once a Grey Knight's armour is locked into the command armature of a nemesis dread knight, however, he is granted the strength and durability to match any demonic lord. Oh, come on. 
Only a few uh, grey knights have the mental fortitude and psychic subtlety to control the giant suit's mechanical limbs and devastating weaponry, while at the same time maintaining the psychic barrier of their ages. Those who do purge the unholy with blasts of psychically impregnated Prometheum from heavy incinerators or other powerful cannons, and before smashing apart armoured foes and ragged mobs of lesser spawn with precision swings of their nemesis great weapons. Should a grey knight fall when his wounds prove too dire for the psychic chirurgery of the chapter's apothecaries to heal, he may yet serve at death's threshold within a dreadnought. Deep inside the layers of adamantine alloy is a sarcophagus containing what remains of the fallen hero. Each is a warrior with centuries, sometimes millennia, of battlefield experience. They are kept alive by biomantic technology that connects them fully with the powerful robotic body they now inhabit. These honoured ancients are woken from stasis only in times of dire need. To fight one is to vainly attempt to defeat a great warrior of legend whose mortal frailties no longer hinder them. Upon the Grey Knight's sacred standards in the Hall of Champions and within the locked pages of certain tomes that the chapter holds are described some of the most pivotal moments in the Imperium's history. These will never be lauded by a thankful populace, and there are no statues to Grey Knights upon worlds they have saved, for there must be no witnesses. The danger of unrestricted knowledge of the demonic has been proven in the blood of entire worlds in which it was allowed to fester. Thus, not even the Grey Knight's greatest victories upon worlds that have been thoroughly sanctified can be known to imperial citizens. Men and women who survive a demonic incursion, even those who have impressed the Grey Knights with their stoic resolve in the face of mind-wrenching madness, are ruthlessly purged during extensive post-battle processing by the Ordo Malleus. The existence of such survivors is obviated by the Inquisition so completely that no record remains of certain regiments or ships' crews even being assigned to the system in question. It is likely that some forces, recorded as being lost in the warp en route to their deployment, actually reached their destination and fought with courage, only for the survivors to be rounded up, interrogated and executed. The Grey Knights are sometimes party to these purges as well, but the Ordo Malleus has resources and experience to conduct many by itself. Particularly valued individuals such as warriors of other space marine chapters and occasionally high-ranking commanders of the Astra Militarum or Navis Imperialis are instead often psychically relieved of all memory of the battle. There have been occasions of resistance to such necessary mental excisions. At least one chapter was forced to undertake an extended penitent crusade to the Galactic Rim, rather than risk being branded excommunicate traitoris over their objections. In the first half of the 41st millennium, an unholy apocalypse engulfed the strategically vital planet of Armageddon. An armed rebellion began in Armageddon's manufactory cities as local warp storm activity increased. Planetary militias responded uh, to brutally suppress these uprisings, but they were only the precursor to a greater threat. Its approach, hidden by the warp storms, a space hulk, codenamed the Devourer of Stars, entered the system. Upon reaching the orbit of Armageddon itself, the huge hulk disgorged a horde of demons, cultists, warp-spawn, possessed mutants, and ancient heretic Astartes of the World Eaters Legion, led by their ferocious demon Primarch Angron. The blood-drenched horde swept through Armageddon Prime, the western half of the planet's primary continent. Imperial reinforcements, including a major force of the Space Wolves chapter, poured into the system. Millions lost their lives to the legions of demon kind and warp-tainted berserkers in the first few weeks. The power of Angron and his horde was sustained by the roiling warp storms, however, and in a fickle lull in the tempests, 
the forces of Titan were able to launch the hammer blow of their attack. The defence of Armageddon Secundus had held long enough for the arrival of the Grey Knights from many brotherhoods. They teleported into the presence of Angron himself, battling the demon Primarch and the Bloodthirsters that fought with him. While other Imperial forces launched counterattacks at Angron's horde, which had been weakened through the Grey Knights' overlapping Aegises, the Sons of Titan fought against Angron, his strikes cleaving apart entire squads of Terminators, thanks to his immortal strength. Finally, the Grey Knights were able to break his blade and banish his essence back to the warp, but the victory came at huge cost. A scant handful of Grey Knights survived the attack. From that Pyrrhic triumph, however, strode warriors who would go on to forge even greater deeds. Arvin Stern, Vorf Mordrek, and Garen Crow among them. The banishment of Angron was far from the end of Imperial losses. Alongside the Ordo Malleus, months were spent executing and mind-wiping billions more to eradicate knowledge of the invasion. Exasperated by the Space Wolves' attempts to inhibit what they saw as dishonourable practices, even entire worlds were put to the sword simply to erase all mention of the battle. Within the ancient warp storm, Known as Geldrif's Eye, the Grey Knights uncovered a hidden ritual. Unfocused visions from the Augurium led a fleet of the First and Second Brotherhoods to discover an armada of word-bearers traitor legion vessels inside the warp, positioned in an octagonal formation. A coven of sorcerers and dark apostles were enacting a murderous ritual from within their ships. Already, warp routes skirting Geldrif's Eye were being perverted. The Gellerfields of Imperial ships making these passages were weakened enough for lurking swarms of warp predators to tear them open and feast on their crews. Though their own Gellerfields were similarly weakened, the combined ages of the Grey Knights kept the circling demons at bay. With their warp sight, the Grey Knights sensed the geometries of the ritual, otherwise invisible through the churning warp that enveloped them. They saw the psychic construction was almost complete, but could also see the nodes that could be unpicked to force the structure to unravel. The strike cruiser Caristo led its sister ships in precision attacks that smashed through the gun decks of the word-bearer's peripheral cruisers. Grey Knights made coordinated teleport strikes against bridge controls and engineeriums. The ancient teleportariums were boosted by the psychic powers of the warriors so that none were scattered, even through the fluxing of the warp's local currents. The Chaos ships struggled to maintain their crucial positioning for the ritual, their own gunnery inflicting minimal damage as it was buffeted by the energies of the halted ceremony. The Grey Knights disengaged as the ritual came apart and the warp's tides rushed in, tearing apart most of the word-bearers' vessels. Antraxis was a mining world, famed throughout the Sadar subsector for its rare bloodstone. When the prognosticars foretold a great evil would arise there, a demi-brotherhood, led by Brother Captain Stern, discovered the planet already in the grip of a rebellion. The Lord of Change, Makeshin, had spread an uprising from the Red Talon Citadel, and the demon had also tainted the bloodstone mines, binding warp nightmares into the rock. With its export, Makeshin's influence spread through the Sadar subsector, sowing discord and mayhem as citizens wearing bloodstone tokens succumbed to possession. Stern ordered half of his strike force to attack and destroy Antraxus's orbital shipyards, while he led the rest in a targeted strike at the Red Talon Citadel. Teleporting into the midst of thousands of cultists in thrall to Makeshin, Stern and his warriors fought towards the demon. He invoked the liturgies of banishment, dueling the greater demon in a battle of wills as his brothers kept the surging cultists at bay with sweeps of their nemesis blades and volleys of bolt fire. Under Stern's psychic onslaught, Makeshin's spells could not save it, and its mortal form burst apart in blue fire. The Grey Knights teleported clear as the flaming debris of the destroyed shipyard struck.
the returned Primarch, Rebute Gilliman, had not been upon terror long before the cataclysmic eruption of the Cicitrix Maledictum. Upon the throne world, the descending blackness drove millions to insanity and rebellious cults arose in many of Terra's hive cities. Warp storms surrounding the planet split open and legions of cornate demons assaulted the Lion's Gate. This bastion at the heart of the Imperial Palace was flanked by battleship-sized gun batteries, but alone they had no hope of prevailing. A demi-brotherhood of Grey Knights, dispatched in haste to terror, fought shoulder to shoulder with thousands of the Adeptus Custodes and countless more defenders. The Grey Knights' specialist knowledge, coordinated strikes and empiric powers helped stem the tide of the 88 cohorts of blood-drenched demons. With the deployment of Sisters of Silence, the Grey Knights fought on with their superlative martial might, even without their powers, stoically enduring the excruciating touch of the Null Maiden's psychic void. When the Lion's Gate was at last reinforced from other portions of the palace, the demons were finally cast down and banished. And that, dear listener, is where the Grey Knights currently are. Thank you for watching, and thanks to everybody who's supporting the channel. Your names are going by as we speak right now, and if you would like to help uh, me and the channel, uh, then do consider becoming a channel member or a patron on Patreon, whichever you prefer. There's uh, links in the description to that and various other things that really help me out if you use them. Uh, otherwise, do give the video a like, and uh, please let me know in the comments what you thought, and what anything, any other subject you'd like me to cover in the future. Uh, these things really, really help me with the uh, the mystical algo. So I appreciate it if you do do that. Um, and if you do become a supporter, your name will be immortalised forever as a producer like these fine chaps here on this roll call of honour. And thank you to everybody who does continue to support the channel. I really, really appreciate it. Thanks again. I'll be back very, very soon. May the Emperor protect. Bye-bye. Terra. -bye.